in golf, I think that that ball speed number is like 182. Like to draw a, a similar line where if your ball speed is over 182 and you don't suck at everything else, <laughs> you, you probably are on tour. I, I do think distance is disproportionately rewarded more than but we ever can, would have. But people can hit it so much straighter now. Is that the technology? Is that? I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't think it matters because my main thing when I get in these arguments with the ar- the, the the architecture levels, you get in arguments a lot. Well, apparently. <laughs> Hey, buddy. What's going on, my friend? Just living the dream, man. How about you? Good. You get some safe travels getting home? Uh, I mean, I guess. It's so weird how trying to be objective and get home and just, uh, fuck, I don't know. It's just so hard to try to do it all. Yep. Um, show me your office. Actually, show me that because I know I've showed you mine. Well, <laughs> that was weird. So it's, uh, this is... This is my office. I've always got something on in the background. So right now I've got the College World Series on. My old coach, Mike Bianco, has got two on with uh, nobody out in the bottom of the ninth. If he wins this game, he goes to the national championship. Um, okay, so, give me the update because a and I know is in there. Gone. Gone. Later. Thank you for coming. Now, they made the final four. They did a great job. I, I mean, a and is great. Coach Schlossnagel, Nolan Kane is a former LSU pitcher and assistant coach is one of the assistants. So anytime the SEC, and you'll learn, well, you're in the SEC now, I forget. Yeah, but I, I do not care about sports. That's important to notice. I don't know. I guess <laughs> it's your age. You shouldn't. So. Yeah, How old are you? No, are you 52? Uh, no, I'll, I'll be 50 in August. Yeah, fuck, we're the same age. <laughs> hey, when the, when the outdoor studio that we're building is done, then I'll take you on the tour of that. Right now, they, like they did the wiring today, so it's cool. So, Perfect. That is really cool, honestly. Like it, you know what it is. I mean, it's it's um, it's a vision that I've had for a long time, and we've got land to do it. So when I closed my office, we moved over here and uh, built this. And I was like, man, I mean, these are my boxes over here, as you can see, for all the cameras and stuff that are going in there. So now I've taken my office and made it into a you know a dump. And then the other thing over here, just like what we get to do, is all the flags, right? But I've got about 80 flags sitting in my closet that I didn't <laughs> have um, room for. So I'll have to go through some of those and see. So I have about 10, but I feel like, again, I, I know I always walk a fine line of someone who I've actually worked with who said thank you or whatever. Like Morikawa, definitely I worked with him. We said thank you. We said you helped me. But I, I don't know Colin at all. Yeah, but I want to hang my flag of him saying thank you. Oh hell yeah! <laughs> it's it's a weird, weird, weird deal. I had I had one guy that I worked with for about four years, and I put a flag in his locker and I said, "Hey, will you sign this just to hang in my office?" And he just signed his name. Yeah. Oh. Like, well. Okay. I should have been more descriptive of what I was asking for. Like, I'm not asking for an endorsement. I'm just asking for, "Hey, Brett." And like, you're you know, the greatest like, ever. Like, just yeah, hey, thanks. Or just hey. I don't know who you are, but for four years we've worked together, right? And then, Trust uh, me. Yeah. It's, it's a very weird paradigm because you and I both, I think we try to stay, but me less than you, try to stay under the radar. Yep. Like we have a deal, me and most of my players, where I'm like, I'm not going to charge you, but I'm going to exploit your name. <laughs> <laughs> See, I'll and I'm you kind of knew you. that when you signed up. And yeah, I get I shit for it. Yeah, no. Again, because you actually make them write you a check. I don't. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm not. I'm not loaded from other things in my life. No, but it's not even that. <laughs> it, like it literally is just like. No, I get it. I made a decision early on to to do this this way, and definitely now I'm I'm reconsidering it. But <laughs> I look at guys like John Graham, and I'm like. I don't want to go out there every single week. Like I don't yeah, want John's to do that. A warrior man, he's amazing. I mean, he is hey, I got, literally. I got, a, I got a question for you. Let, let's transition to some golf here for a second. All right, I got a question. All right, so I'm out at um, Brookline last week. What a great golf course! Huge fan. Usually, I'm not a fan of USGA courses. I'll be honest. I think that 
it's like we take a great course and we try to trick it up. But I thought Brookline was fantastic. Amazing. Okay? Amazing. I, I, if it takes 30 something, like, why don't we sign that like we did to the Oakmont and go every X number of years? That place can put on a championship. Like, Again, I don't know the, the specifics of the club or how they laid out the commercial pavilions, but I, I do think that golf has to be looked at more as a, an exhibition now. And this isn't even live related. It's just, you just like, it's just not the same game that it was a hundred years ago or even 40 years ago. And so I agree the the course was amazing this week, but you can't go back there every so often because also these guys are really rich assholes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I hate saying it that well, they way, but it's like their course for four weeks. Yeah, well, four yeah. weeks is not like that's the bare minimum. It is literally about a five to seven month process, just like 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 TBC Scottsdale. Yeah, that place is a train wreck, literally. 12 months a year. Yeah. And so you just have to sit back and be like, well, if we want the circus, then this is what it takes. And if we don't, then that's what it takes. Like press okay, the trails. So, so, so talk to me about strategy then. Right. So strategy now, you know, I, Tiger made a statement during the PJ championship and he said in his interview, he said, it's not like the days of Lee Jansen and Scott Simpson, where you just hit four iron off the tee to get position and then attack from there. These guys I'm playing with are bombing it off the tee. Okay. So when I take a look at the U.S. Open, right, it's either you send it down there so far or hit it so far offline you get in the walking areas or you hit the fairway. You don't have a chance to score if you're not in play off the tee. But is the I, distance differential that big of a deal? It is. And, and this is where I do get conflicted because I love the game of golf. I, I literally do love the game of golf. And I, I think that most – architecture fans would be like Scott's an asshole. He doesn't know what he's talking about. When I look at, again, there's, there's an analogy like to basketball of if you are over seven feet tall, there's a 43% chance you've been in the NBA at some point in your life. And there's a 12% chance you're in the NBA right now hmm. in golf. I think that that ball speed number is like 182 like to draw a, a similar line where if your ball speed is over 182 and you don't suck at everything else, <laughs> you, you probably are on tour. I, I do think distance is disproportionately rewarded more than but we ever can, would have. But people can hit it so much straighter now. Is that the technology? Is that, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't think it matters because my main thing when I get in these arguments with the ar the, the the architecture levels, you get in arguments a lot. Well, <laughs> apparently, <laughs> but I literally can I can go back and show me with very 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 old equipment and showing I can get a one point five smash factor with a good, without getting into the the size of that like. Club head speed of 120 times 1.5 is 180 mile, uh, 180 mile hour ball speed. I, I think that's just the standard right now. I don't think that anyone is actually going to be faster than that. And I think that that number is actually attainable by everyone. And so not everyone can be seven feet tall, but everyone can get to 180 mile ball speed. And the main point of that is and I literally texted Como and Bryson this middle of last summer, you know, almost you know, nine months ago now. There is an upper limit of what's usable in golf. So, like, if someone was 12 feet tall, that wouldn't help in basketball. At some point, it's just too tall. Well, minute bowl, seven foot seven. Uh, perfect yeah. example. You just you you literally at some point it's just too much. So how do you proof a golf course? Somebody asked, is Augusta distance proofed? Augusta <laughs> wants to see birdies on the back nine on Sunday. I mean, they set up a beautiful golf course. It's it, it's built for that. I mean, they they don't want to see guys limping in. They want to see guys rewarded and scored. Scored. And, and, and I love that. Honestly, I, I really too. do. I I, I think that no, there's no getting around it other than trees. I, I really do actually believe that. So the USGA called me 
four or five months ago and asking questions about Brookline because Jason Gore told me like they're literally thinking about pinching these fairways in at 300 yards to where there's just no fairways. I, I do think that's chicken shit. I, I don't have a better word to say for it than that. I agree. Like you would not just make a rim lower because somebody, if, if we want golf to be a sport, like an actual athletic endeavor, well then size and strength matters. And I hate boiling sports down to that because it is very much, well, I'm 5'9". Again, I'm 6'1". I'm 6'1", 215. How big are you, Doc? You're 6'4"? 6'5", six, six, about 275. Yeah, fuck. You're a huge human. <laughs> there is no reason. I could not. I forget, I, I forget that I'm a big guy. I mean, my dad was 6'5". You know, being on baseball teams, I, would, I mean, I'm not going to say I was the average size. That would be weird. But in athletic departments – I mean, with football guys, basketball, I mean, basketball would be a point guard, right? Yeah. Um, and, and, and it is kind of unique. And then I get together with my friends, you know, in life, and I'm like, crap, I'm, I'm, I'm a freaking beast. <laughs> I feel like you are. Sometimes. Yeah. Again, like, you are a huge human, no offense, but you're a big dude. And, and I am, too, even at 6'1", 215. And, and golf has historically just been viewed as a – a non-sport again, like even the guys like a Corey Pavin or a Brad Faxon would say, like it's a sport, and I would just like you don't believe that. Otherwise, you wouldn't complain the way you do about certain things. I mean, we don't and complain then, about major league baseball players or college kids still ninety-seven. No, okay. Randy like Johnson. But, the only reason oh, yeah. he throws it so hard is a longer lever. Like, yeah, that's it. But but do you do you? I mean, you don't see a point when they're going to limit and neuter the long hitter, right? I mean, because that's not good for the I distance. do. Do you really? I do, and I think that's a problem. Okay, but but we can look at hole number 11. Hole number 11, um, you know, it's it's one of those things where, you know, hole number 11 at Brookline, there weren't a whole lot of birdies, and there were a lot of double bogeys were missing from 121 yards downhill into the wind. You just said, do you see eventually-ish? Yeah. I, I don't see it right now. I do see that's where they're morphing. And, 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 like, I have been very fortunate, as, as accidental as all this decade stuff is, to be able to say to Como last year, like, literally 50 months ago, man, this is it. Like, I, I actually do think, if you think of standard deviation of directional and distance control, I do think there's an upper limit of what's usable. And I think that 195 to 200 mile an hour ball speed is it. And the problem is, I actually do think almost everyone can get to that speed. Rory, I mean, again, there's nobody fitter than him on the planet, but he is in that 185, 190 ball speed range at five foot ten. Like his he's not, ball just sounds different on the range. I mean, yeah, I mean, he just fucking hammers it. Period. Yeah, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous, and I do think that everyone, again, with work because now we're talking about professional athletics. I do think everyone is capable of that. I, I, I legitimately mean that. And this is where I well, try. We showed that with, with, with Matt Fitzpatrick, right? With his work with Sasha McKenzie. Oh. I mean, not only was he just getting relevant, he got, I mean, he was leading. Long. Yeah. Like Matthew, again, he's a guy that I've worked for almost four years now, like way before Sasho and Eduardo Malinari and even his brother Alex, he and I have been bouncing ideas off each other for a long time. Mm -hmm. Again, this is where I get super conflicted because I would never say, like Sam Burns, yep. I, I worked with him. Yep. I would not say he's a decade guy, but like I know I influenced him. Yep. I, would, I would treat Matthew Fitzpatrick the same way. Like I would, man, I, I, he's not a decade guy, but I know what he thinks. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, I do think there is a, an, an end range of what is usable. And Matthew, for his body style, is butting up against it. Like, there, you, you do at some point just have to have longer levers to get better. But it's just crazy to me that of all the people on the planet, like, again, I'm the guy that told Bryson, dude, hit as far as you can. Okay, and but, Matthew, but, but Matthew, the point is Matthew's like, that's not golf. No, 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 no. It is golf, 
it's not traditional golf. Right. Do, you, do you see that? Do you understand yeah, what I'm saying there? I understand. So, so if you were to set up a golf course right now for a PGA Tour event, right? And I know some of them are limited, but how would you do it? Trees. I hate saying it. It's, it's the only, if you want to, again, back to the old analogy of if you are seven feet tall, there's a 43% chance you've played in the NBA at some point. Mm-hmm. I would say if you have 185 mile an hour ball speed, eventually that statement's going to be, well, you've played on tour before. Yeah. I at 49 years old in 10 days, I can hit a ball 190. Mm-hmm. It's, it's such an advantage. It's unbelievable. And I do actually hate saying it because I do think it makes the game dirty. I, I don't know the right word for it, but it's not as interesting at all if you just blow it past everyone, but that's exactly what Fitzpatrick said in his post championship interview. He was like, you know what? It's kind of fun to just know I can hit it past everyone, just bomb it down there and then figure it out. That is a direct quote from him. And that's a direct quote of what I told him two years ago when he was giving Bryce a hard time saying, it's just not golf. No, it is golf. It's just a different golf. Yeah, than we're I mean, used I can to. remember. I can remember being on the mound and finding my fastball, and then realizing I can throw it by you. Like exactly. I mean, it's it, there's a power, there's a confidence that builds from that. But I mean, I think you know we, we take a look at junior golfers, and, and there's a big argument right now about Live Tour and PGA Tour, and you know growing the game. And and to me, we've never had more people trying to get into the game. And I think at the same time, we need to have more players playing in more places across the world. There's no reason for it. I've always said that I get it. There's supposedly like some world golf ranking reason, but there should be a, a United States based tour lower than the corn Ferry that then leads to the corn Ferry that leads to the PGA tour. There's no reason for it not to be. And, and it just opens up people to scams, but you look at the college ranks. Now you look at the junior ranks. I mean, I was on the range down in Sawgrass right before the PJ with Billy, and we were watching a kid hit it. I mean, he was 205 with a seven iron smooth on the I mean, just sending it. And I'm like, my God. And the kid was built like a catcher from baseball. I was like, my God. That's the deal. Just, it was insane to watch. Like, and, and we were like, okay, get after this one. 346 carry. I'm like, good God. And he was like, I still I, got more. I mean, I'm like, my God, you still got more. And by the way, college coaches on here, he's uncommitted. Like <laughs> somebody get that kid, I mean, the kick of play, get him on your roster and te- and let him learn to play the game because you don't, it's hard to teach speed, right? They always said that in baseball, can't teach speed. You can't. I mean, the end, this is where I do believe golf is officially a, a sport. I've actually thought that for a long time. Now, when but... you played in college is the same time I was in college. My, our PGA, our, our golfers used to come in the weight room and we were working out. Guys like Brian Bateman and Scott Sterling, PGA Tour players, right? I mean, they became tour players. Good. Good. They used to come in in their golf shirt and their golf shorts and sit on the exercise bike and move the wheels around and be like, can we leave? You know? And I was like, God, I'd love to be a golfer. Well, again, like back to G. Raleigh uh, at, at AM, I would go in there every time. And I, I remember watching Leo McElroy actually do the NFL combine while I was working out. And again, this is maybe where as you get a little older, you get more objective and be like, wow, I'm batshit crazy. Mm-hmm. I don't think I realized that when I was younger, but I was always like, I'm going to do better than that. I don't care what you are or who you did. Leland literally threw up 225 about 60 times in about 60 seconds. And I'm like, that's unreal. Like I can do it yeah. once but I'm going to try to do it seven times right now and just watch that guy pump out these rounds. And again, this is where it gets super conflicted, but I do believe golf is actually a sport. Like, hell yeah, I'm it's actually, a sport. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying if to I, like, if I walk 18 holes, I'm winded. So therefore it's well, defined as a sport. Well, that's where I'm trying to kneel down to the people that hate us and be like, it's actually a sport. Like every other sport goes to golf for relaxation. That's the problem is everyone thinks it's like, let's have a few it beers. Let's hang out. Screws every other athlete, every other athlete that I work with, a professional athlete that comes in to improve their golf game is mesmerized and frustrated. 
<laughs> Mainly because the sport sucks. Had, I mean, had again, a had, had a question. What speed training is the best? I mean, obviously, Sasha's program, the stack, is phenomenal. I got really lucky. So I did do a couple of commercials for Super Speed back over the, the winter. Yep. But I also reached out to Sasha about six weeks ago. I was like, hey, you know what? I'm just trying to make sure I'm like covering the bases, if you will, and, and giving people great information. Pick up heavy shit and set it down and or pick up heavy stuff and swing it fast. The thing about Sasha's stack is... And this is why it's expensive. And it's the main reason I told him, like, dude, 300 for a weighted club versus 100 for a weighted club is a problem. But I do think, and I hate saying AI because that makes it sound way more smart than it is. But just take the app and actually swing the club as fast as you can. And the thing will learn what you do best and, and the main thing that I try to do with my players is give them actionable information. So, hey, score lower. That, well, that's not helpful. I know score lower. Swing the club faster. I, I, I understand that. But what the stack actually does is tell you how and why to swing it faster. Mm. And, again, I, I, I truly do believe in it. And, again, I'm just so conflicted as I sit here and talk about this. Distance is disproportionately rewarded so much like height is in basketball or strength is for a middle so linebacker. Smash it off the tee. Fucking yeah. hammer it. If what well, there's a caveat to the deck. No, well, it's wait, really not. Sixty yards wide? It's but it's all relative to your ability. It really is all relative to your ability. So All right, so we had somebody who asked on this, I'm an eight handicap. Fire at pins? I know the answer to that. Clearly, no. But off the T specifically, the, the main question to always ask yourself is, what's the alternative and what does it accomplish? And that answer typically is not much. So, so off, fifth hole, the fifth hole at Brookline was a perfect uh, example. Send it, right? Send it, for sure. And I do think Will should have. I, I a million percent think that Again, we've got 63 people watching here. There's a there's a better than zero chance Will was one of them. I do think he should have sent it off that tee. So there's there's an analogy that I make, and I think it's a pretty good one. If my nine-year-old daughter, if I sat down with her at the World Series of Poker, and I said to everyone at the table, she's only playing aces and kings, and she's shoving all in when she does. And literally turned her cards over. So everyone has perfect information. I do think 99% of the time she would make it into day two of the World Series of Poker. But she would never make it past noon. Because you're folding away too much equity. And I think that Will, even though he knew, I don't really feel good with my driver right now. And if he had hit driver, let's pretend worst case scenario he hit it in the shit every single time. Well, he's going to make a couple pars and a couple bogeys. He mm. only plays it two shots worse than he did. But let's pretend he actually hits the green a couple times and puts in the bunker a couple times. He probably gains two shots. So he is actually folding away a little bit of equity by trying to play what he thinks is smart because he doesn't actually feel good with his driver, it, it's 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 a really really like hard it's, it's, point. Because that's where the mental side comes in, right? Because if you're not feeling it, then are are you better to build off a little, you know, build up a little bit momentum? I mean, the I, problem I, I, is I like, the I like problem is how, I mean, I like how often it. I like attacking. So exactly the the biggest problem to me is I'm not feeling it today. Well, how often are you actually? jumping back from I'm feeling it to I'm not feeling it. And that's really, to me, the biggest problem where you're just giving up too often. Mm -hmm. And that's a bad idea. Like, again, I get it. You're probably going to hit the shit once, but are you really hitting there three times? I mean, probably not. And, and yeah. just allocating the, 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 the strategy and the aggression appropriately 
I don't think it's possible to do when you're worried about mistake, like again, mitigation. So, so let's talk about that game theory for a little bit, right? So game theory in poker and golf, golf's, golf is ultimately a game of percentages. I come from baseball. It was a game of percentages. You play the game. That's why you play 162 games in Major League Baseball. That's why you play 70 games in college baseball. It's got to have time for the, the good shit to rise to the top, the bad stuff to fall through, and you get over the luck. So, you know, in game theory of poker, right, there's ultimately the cards will go your way a certain percentage of the times, but you have to be the person who's playing the cards you got. And there's a sub game within a game every single hand, right? Oh, for sure. Okay. There's a sub game in the game of golf too, right? What I try to tell people is utopian is you have no idea what your score is or where you stand to par or where you stand in the tournament. And non-utopian is batshit crazy. I am totally fixated on what we're doing. Neither one of those. Well, I do actually think that utopian is ideal. There's no way you're going to do it, so that's actually not good advice. So the closer we can get you to that, in my opinion, the better. So, yeah, there's no way you will never know. But, okay, if we're I was about. about hold on one second. Is, I'm going to argue: Is golf a sport when you're not when people are taught to not look at the scoreboard? Come on. Every other sport has a scoreboard right there in front of you. It is I, the fact every pitch I threw, I knew what the score was in the, the count. It is the fact, fact that golf is the only sport that is played where you don't play defense. It is a non uh, You're not even playing the other people in the field. Period. You just like again, it's a utopian idea. Golf of, you are playing the golf course. Again, it, it takes a lot to wrap your head around it. And again, I sit, I have sat around for the last six years and telling people this is how it works. And now I finally had surgery on both elbows. I'm back playing golf myself. And three weeks ago now, I was playing in my club championship. And it was like, I know I'm right around the lead ish. We got Tony Romo. Again, Tony's a great dude. We got other good players. And I'm just sitting there looking, I'm like, if I actually knew where I stood because I did not, would it change anything? That answer is no. There is nothing you can do because I can't okay, impact that's, your play. That's, that's a, either either you have an ability to not have to think as a Texas A&M grad, which Whoop. probably probably got you in there, or you have an ability to separate yourself from the outcome, which is really good which is really hard because pressure in circumstance changes us, right? There is real pressure. There is moments where people feel different. Again, I'm, I'm, tr I'm trying to afford that outcome. Like I get it. What I'm saying is utopian. Okay. You, utopian at the craps table is every roll of the dice is played independently. Well, it is. It is, I mean, but but the team we play dice certain, like, the, I know it does. It does, but there's feels, there's roles. Or are we just? Is that the gambler's fallacy of psychology? It's the gambler's fallacy. Uh, like yeah. it doesn't. I don't give a shit if you've rolled ten straight blacks or blacks like in so, roulette. Yeah, I mean, I'm just like I've got a buddy who you could always look at him from across the casino and be like, that that bar is black. This guy is printing money. They literally don't matter. And, no, and I, I, I do actually, this is where I actually think of, like you and I, you're a guy who's way more experienced, obviously, than I am. You have worked with way better players than I have. I'm kind of a guy. Well, but again, I'm a guy that's kind of backed my way in to be like, hey, I kind of know what I'm talking about. But you actually know what you're talking about. I, I do just firmly believe you, it's out of your control. Like, why don't we do? Why don't we do a golf school in Vegas? You and me. The fuck, I'm in for sure. <laughs> anybody, man. anybody on this thing, give us a, a like if you would like to. We got we got sixty three people that all of a sudden we got ninety three. Really you can't see where shit. Well, that's probably true. <laughs> but it would be. I, I really do. I mean, again, I'm with you on that because. At the end of the day, I mean, pressure does impact us. It changes us. It changes the way we move, we think, we decide, all that other stuff, right? But at the end of the day, it's one of those things that 
we must stay focused on ultimately what are we trying to do with the shot at hand, right? Exactly. Now, here it comes. Now they're coming through. Yeah, I know. We'll get some people in Vegas. I don't know where we're then. in. in Las Vegas. I, 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 I truly do believe that it all comes down to objective analysis of what is actually possible and then applying that decision science, like maybe it's because I spoke at Wharton today where all we were talking about is decision analytics and whatever, but I'm like, at the end of the day, like there are only so many decisions and there's only so much you can do. And so you have to pick your best course and then live with the results. Like it's but that's so where the psycho- That's where psychology messes with us though, isn't it? Because we start putting expectations on it but we start putting all kinds of, yeah, we'll go see Joe Mayo. Um, you know, people start putting, and he'll talk game theory too. We start putting all those expectations on stuff and we, we allow our ego to define our experience, right? Like all of a sudden, like if you and I took, took guys on this thing, okay. And we go out and we play and I drop a ball in the middle of the fairway. You know, I drop a ball in the rough and I said, all right, Scott, I want you to play this shot. You'd look at it, you would evaluate and you'd make a plan. But the fact that you hit the ball there, you've now brought in anger and frustration and judgment of self to that shot. You've now changed the game versus just a shot in the fairway or a shot in the rough. You're now saying, dude, I've done that. What's wrong with me? Why am I a problem? Why is this continuing? Stuff like that. Well, to that point, exactly, is like Zalatoris. Again, I caddied for him when he won the Texas AM US Junior. Like, I've known him since he was nine. Like, I understand the putting isn't pretty, but at the end of the day, it's functional. And this is where it gets super frustrating because the announcers will, they refuse to say once we bring in the PGA and the U S open and the masters, because those things are excluded from strokes gain. He's actually positive strokes gain on the year. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying the guy's the greatest putter on the planet, but at the end of the day, there are, 170 guys that are worse than him. I get it. You don't like the way it looks, but it's also functional. And the more people can realize again, especially at home, like I don't give a shit. Like Fitzpatrick chipping cross-handed. I look at it like, Holy shit, man, that's so disgusting. But the guy gets it kind of close to the hole. At the end of the day, what I, what I spoke about today at Wharton was three feet, they average one stroke to hole out. Eight feet, they average one and a half strokes to hole out. So in the first five feet of, of distance, they lose a half a shot of expectation. Then to go from eight feet to 32 feet is where they lose the next half a shot. So hmm. you lose the first half shot in five feet. You lose the next half shot in 24 feet. If you actually look at the volume and square footage area of that, it's just mind boggling. But you, you, the only thing you can back out of that is, and I hate saying this, but like golf is kind of luck. It, there, there is. <laughs> I've, I've said forever, I've said forever that success is four factors your skills and your talent. But on the PJ Tour, there's not a big separation. So it's how do you apply those skills and talent under pressure? How do you, how mentally flexible you are and how do you deal with luck? That's success. How do you deal with luck? I, I honestly think that is, that, that is it's, it's, it's a hundred X times what anyone else would actually think it is. One of my guys called me after the open, US open. He's like, fuck, I played so good. I missed the cut. He's like, I literally hit two fairways and bounced in the rough by two and a half feet and was stymied. Yep. And he's like, Next week, the ball is going to bounce left and be in the middle of the fairway. And but he, his attitude was great. He was like, "This is what we talked about going in. I knew that this was part of the deal, and I tried to compete with it. I just I felt like I didn't counter it well enough." He wasn't saying it in a bad way. He's just like, "I just didn't have I didn't have enough holes to." It's just reality. It is. It was just reality. He's like, "Some bitch. If I make this cut, I may run up. The, I was playing so good, I may run up the leaderboard." And I'm like, you, you post a two under on Saturday, and all of a sudden you're like in the mix. Yeah. And it's Denny just, McCarthy, right? Well, exactly. I mean, literally, Denny, exactly. It's, again, this is where the game, I, I, there are so many times I leave my seminars and like, 
Well, I just convinced these 20 people never to play golf again <laughs> because the fucking You do game. have such a positive disposition <laughs> on life. <laughs> <laughs> well, trust me, that was my entire presentation. And Ward today where they're like, wow, this game sucks. I'm like, it does. But that's what makes it great. I mean, it is. But, but isn't golf the ultimate? It's the ultimate, what we call in psychology, intermittent schedule of reinforcement. It's like going to Vegas. I pull the lever today, I hit a jackpot. I pull the lever tomorrow, don't hit shit. I pull it again, don't hit. It's unpredictable. When you're ultimately at that level, the variance between great play, and this is why it's such a mental game, is that it is so intermittent. It is not the biggest guys win. It's not the fastest guys will outrun. It's not the team with the best seven footers that can shoot. It's but it's about to be. I I do I hate know. saying I, that. You you you're you're limiting the field when you allow that to happen. I really okay. again like there there is a big part of me, like all of this decade stuff is an accident. Like it legitimately is like I'm not being humble or whatever. I'm like this is kind of a joke. It it really is. But I do think I have ex- like lifted the rock over what's exploited in the game, mm-hmm. and in hindsight, only because like I had a a quasi successful professional career, and I used to hit it past everyone. The only reason I was decent was because I bombed it past everyone. It'd be mm-hmm. like taking a guy that sucks at everything at baseball but can throw one oh seven down the pipe, like that was kind of me and you get away with it but man it's just the whole game i don't want to say it should shift or it can shift or it might shift but like it's a sport we as much as we wanted to think golf was a sport before it just wasn't and now it it is okay but it is uh, i know i got somebody who just joined who's i'll say this from another sport he plays for my old, one of my old teammates got walked that was in my wedding with me. Um, but is there, is this the thing? Cause if you watch the baseball peers, they'll think that the nerds have ruined baseball, right? Are we going to get to that point with golf? I think so. Probably. I mean, at the end of the day, golf specifically, the, the elusive mystical folklore point of the game was how do you get your ball around the course in the few sco- strokes possible? Mm-hmm. Well, what's funny to me is the biggest contrarian belief that I actually agree with when people say, like, isn't this obvious in common sense? Like, I actually don't disagree. Like, it, it, it absolutely is. But no one does it. And so if we actually – let's don't do the, the game of who's the greatest player of all time because it's Jack or Tiger – I don't give a shit what camp you're in. It's one of those two. Now, which one of those, who's the right, best who's, course? Who's the best in basketball? Oh, well, I, I don't follow enough. I would assume, Mike, I, I, again, I literally don't follow sports enough. In my opinion, in golf, like, it's Tiger. It's not even close. It's not literally, even close. it's not, not even close. close. Like, not even close. Yeah, I don't give a shit how many seconds Tiger had or Jack had. Will already has three. Like, he's not one eighteenth or one sixth the player that Jack was. Like, it's just a dumb argument, in my opinion. the The main point is, once you're actually trying to just play golf for the lowest score, there are two guys who are in the conversation of the goat. But there are also only two guys who are in the conversation of the greatest strategists ever. And so to me, it can't be common sense then. Hey, Doc, what, what's two plus two? I think About four. four? Yeah. yeah. There's no common sense best answer to two plus two. There also can't be a common sense best answer to who's the greatest course manager ever because everyone would do it if it was common sense. So... It, the, 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 the argument falls flat on its face, in my opinion. And, and the, the bigger point is simply you just don't know what's going to happen until you hit the shot. And you can't actually analyze the results until you hit the shot and know the results and expectation. 
And so you can't even do the math until you actually do it before you hit the shot. Does that make? Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, hundred yeah, percent. It's you're a so, big dude that can throw a fucking fastball. I bet really fast. Not fast enough. That's why I became a psychologist. A hundred percent. But at your level, you could and did. Did okay. And then you eventually morph out. And I feel like that's what golf is too. Unfortunately, it's going to be size related more than anything that the historians wanted to be before. Well, I think the historians want to, I think we want to, I think people want to make it this glorious golf in the kingdom as sport. It's not that anymore. It's not. It's, it's, it's not even close. No. It's a game of elite athletes competing. I mean, take, take a look at I me, mean, of the guys that, you know, and I'll say this, like Billy, fit as hell, right? He is max. The dude's a rock star. He's a rock star. It's so cool to watch after the win of the Memorial. People really getting to see, to see Billy the way he is. He's a stud. Sam, his legs are like tree trunks. John, built. Salvatoris. Yeah. Legs are like tree trunks. Like, he's so skinny. I'm like, if you could get that guy in shorts, his calves would blow your mind. Sam's the same way. Again, carry on. So. Oh, yeah. No, no. But, I mean, you just see it's the physical nature. And, and, and I'm not going to pick on you a little bit, but, I mean, I can remember being a kid and being like, oh, the golf <laughs> team, right? Oh. Now you go to a high school, you look at the golf team, you're like, shit, why are these guys not playing baseball? I don't blame them. That's, it's, it's literally what I say all the time. Like, if, if I were a high school senior right now, on the golf team, I would be about average. Again, I'm 6'1", 215. I'm a big dude. I, I, I'm not necessarily like a, a linebacker, but I could take a guard and I could slow him down at a minimum. If you go back to high school, that's not the case at all. Yeah. And this is where it gets weird because golf, we want to be looked at as athletes, but we don't actually want to be looked at as athletes. All right, I got a question for you. Future Masters is a big junior tournament in Dothan, Alabama, right? It's played in the heat of the summer. It's this week. It it runs in different divisions. Junior golfers put exorbitant amount of pressure on themselves to perform at a level. They try to perform at their ideal, their A-plus game every single time. And parents tend to think that's how they should perform too. What's your your recommendations there? I just think we need to to set a schedule – not worry about what this tournament gets me into for the next one. I, I say this all the time. I, I love Will's dad, Rick. He's an amazing dude. He's done a great job with Will. I love Will. He's done a great job. But the, the thing that drove me batshit crazy back in the day was, well, I don't want to play in this tournament because if I don't play good here, it won't give me in that. And if I do this, it, dude, just go play golf. You're so far away from it actually mattering. Just go shoot scores. I just so what, what would you tell parents out there who feel the need for scholarships and and having to get to that spot? I mean, the pressure these kids are facing. I mean, you know, the the number of kids and it's going to transition us into a conversation real quick. I'm writing a new book on anxiety, um, and it, it's it's really fucking good. I mean, I've suffered from anxiety my entire life. I've had panic attacks. I talk about it in the book. Um, but have I you really so, like how often? Yeah. Like, what does that uh, mean? I think that's important to acknowledge. Well, I'll I'll, I'll say this. When I was in grad school, I can remember it was my third or fourth year. I had to stay an extra year because I had to do an extra master's thesis because my first one failed. I didn't get failed. We couldn't collect the data in time. Um, And so I had a lot of pressure, a lot of stress working around the clock. You know, my professor trained us like medical residents. So we were up, we were on the floor at six and off the floor at 8 p.m. at night. And we just went around the clock. And... I had a three-year-old daughter, and I went to. Did you know at the time that's and... insane? I mean, like, did you actually oh, yeah, recognize yeah. this is dumb? And not that it was dumb; it was I had no choice. Like, well, that's that's is, the I'm, same thing. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna do this, and I'm gonna beat everybody at this. Um, and I know this is hard. My wife was a nurse, and um, it was it was we had a great we had very supportive families, but at the same time, it was hard. And so I was on an airplane. We were coming back from San Diego. We had. We're running. We had an hour. I can never forget this. We had an hour to catch our connection flight in Houston to New Orleans. We ran through a um, um, a Taco Bell in the Houston airport. We ate it as fast as we could, and I got on the plane, and all of a sudden, 
I felt like I was going to puke everywhere, but it was hot and whatever. And I went into a full blown panic attack and I started having panic attacks, um, usually all based around sensation of vomiting or being, you know, upset stomach and knowing what, how to treat it. Right. Cause that's what I was in school for. And I was far enough along that I kind of understood it had done it. What I realized was I started taking myself into McDonald's and Burger Kings on campus and I would eat, but I would sit next to the door and force myself to sit there and face the anxiety and the vomit feeling. But you and, didn't know it. Oh, I knew what it was. I mean, I, I knew. But I'm it. saying like consciously at the time, did you actually know what was going on? Oh, hell yeah. I knew exactly what was going on. I mean, a panic attack is like a, like your alarm system in your house, misreading a bird hitting the window at two o'clock in the morning. It's telling you it's a burglar coming in to kill you you lose the rational nature. I knew it was rational, but I also knew that if I ate and I started getting a sick stomach, you know, exposure therapy, I, mean, I just exposed myself to the bad environment and I forced myself to sit there. And it took me about two years to get over being in an environment where I used to not eat on airplanes at all. I would, I, if I had to fly all day, I would eat nothing. Um, God damn, this I is why I love you, Doc. Seriously. Yeah. That's no, 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 amazing. No. That is yeah. literally amazing to realize. And not a lot of people knew it. In fact, I wrote a chapter today. I sent it to my wife, and she's like, I had no idea. And, yeah, God damn, of, that's it, amazing. I mean, because I was, there's an embarrassment part. I mean, what I was afraid of was I don't like the feeling of vomiting. No, no many people do. But it was the embarrassment of losing control in public. Now, in the last three years, I've had three cases of food poisoning, and I'm over the fear of vomiting, right? Not a big deal. Um, but the, um, yeah, but I would, I would worry about it. I always say it's probably why I didn't go to med school is because I didn't want to lose control. What had happened was prior to that, I was in an autopsy. I was in a brain cut, um, in grad school and a nurse nursing student fell in front of the door and went, no, we couldn't get out. And I, and that's kind of the first time it hit me. And so what I would do is I would expose myself to the scenarios and every once in a while, um, I would sit there and, and. You know, even to this day, like I was at a conference a couple of weeks ago and that thought popped back in my head. I felt the flip in my stomach, but I was like, nope, I, if it happens, it happens. So I learned what I tell people now with anxieties, instead of resisting it, I want you to become an interested observer of it. I want you Ex to, I want you to huge. live. Expand so, on that, honestly, like, well, like I'm saying that, because that's, that's the one thing that that's, it's a yeah. very intelligent way of saying what I try to get people to realize, like dig into that. Like, I think that's incredible. Well, if, a lot of times what we do in anxiety is the resistance itself causes more reaction and more psychophysiological arousal. So body and mind arousal, anxiety, panic attacks is just nothing more than our fight or flight system, our adrenaline pumping and it's doing its job. It's just doing it at the wrong damn time. Like if you've ever had your home alarm go off in the middle of the night, that's what your body's doing. So what I did is instead of, rushing to judgment like who cares if i puke in front of people like seriously who cares and then it was like tell me what i feel and i started getting really good at saying okay i feel like my stomach is tightening up i feel like it's moving up my you know you have that when before you get sick you have that um that sweet saliva in your mouth that oh, yeah. taste yeah so i started getting to a point where i would i would i would like try to dissect what that tasted like versus judging um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a reframing. Also, also it's a reframing. It's a mindfulness. It's acceptance. Right. And I'm a very, very big fan of a psychologist who trained at Brown before I went there by the name of Stephen Hayes and his act. You went to Brown? Was, I did. I did my internship. God my damn, internship. I'm so underqualified. <laughs> but, it, but it was cool because the guy, the, the <laughs> foremost leader, the foremost leader in panic attacks, a guy by the name of David Barlow. Um, he's the one that started the internship. Stephen Hayes was in the very first internship class. When I look at that alumni list, I'm like, holy shit. It's like the who's who of psychology, right? And, and it's so funny because I look at that. And so I, I reached out to Stephen one day and that was a nice connection for us. But I was like, what he taught me was, hey, look, you're going to be anxious. It's the judgment. It's the feeling like something's off. It's feeling like something's wrong. And the more we resist against it. And so, yeah, that's how I got through anxiety. And I still have a lot of just low level anxiety. Like the worst thing that can happen is somebody sends me a message saying, hey, call me so we can chat. My mind <laughs> automatically goes to fucking fire. Like, you know, I had it happen this week. I mean, one of my guys texted me on Monday. Hey, I'm in the car for 90 minutes. Can you call me? 
Let's talk. I'm like, oh, shit. I know. And afterwards, he's like, best team meeting ever, man. Love my dog. Riding and dying on my team. I'm like, God damn it. I mean, that's how I feel. I, mean, I got to get you my phone number because I just, man, it just drives me crazy. It is hard. If somebody wants to screw with me, send me a message and say, can't talk to David. We need to talk in the next couple of days. God. Oh, my God. I'll be calling you nonstop. But anyway, I, but, but that we live. So I put out a tweet the other day that said, everybody's focusing on depression right now for obvious reasons, right? Suicide rates are up. Let's talk to you about that. We know about um, drug abuse. Overdoses are up. Violence is up. But anxiety is sitting behind the scenes. And it's like the freaking monster in Stranger Things. It's coming, and it's, it's a bad son of a bitch. And we live in a world of perfectionism and too high standards, and it's just it's strangling our kids, and it's strangling us because people think they have to live this perfect way. They have to play this perfect way. They can't make mistakes. I literally had a dad tell me, all the work you've done is blown because my kid shot 82 in a tournament. I'm like, you're serious. Like, it's insane. Can you imagine walking out there? And it's like your kid's a bomb, dif- bomb diffuser having to walk out there. No, man, play the freaking game. I, I, I legitimately do believe we're over catastrophizing everything going on right now mm-hmm. to where, like, there's just a normal range of outcomes. And I, my daughters are 9 and 12. And there's times when I'm like, just let them fail. Let them fuck this up. And I can't let them do it. And, wow. again, I, I feel like I'm a super so objective person. Bike. When they rode a bike, you couldn't hold onto the seat. My oldest daughter, Logan, it's, she's got a she has a significant case of Crohn's disease, and it hit her in college, her sophomore year, fall. Yeah, it was fall. She was having a lot of control, like stomach issues, and missing a lot of class and everything. And I can remember she came home from um, for the Christmas break, and she's sitting at the kitchen table. She's like, "I made two D's," <clears throat> and she was like, "But I'm proud I didn't make F's." And I was like, "Proud." And she got all upset. And I said, no, 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 no. I made a D in college. Okay. And it changed my, I changed my entire way of doing everything that I do. Didn't make lower than an A after that. I said, I don't want you proud that you didn't fail. I want you motivated to change the way you study, prepare, and, and organize. She never made below an A after that. And she finished like a 3.8 grade point average with two Ds. Went back and took one of the classes again and dominated it. Parents, can can, can I give you my kids? Yeah. <laughs> if I could just ship them your way, it would make my <laughs> life done. a lot easier. I'm like 25 and 21, love them to death, but I'm done. I got nine and 12. Yeah. I, I, I really do, though. I, I just, I look at, and I know you work with, and again, you're way quieter than I am for obvious reasons, but I know who you work with, and I'm like, God, just that guy has to exclaim, I'm trying my hardest. Like, Mm-hmm. I'm just going to say, fuck it, John Rom. Like, that guy is a guy I used to use as my poster boy. Like, he he doesn't compartmentalize well. And now he's just, it's all he has to do it. So he he is, you know, he would probably be like me. I look back at myself in my 20s. My dad was a hothead. I would be like, well, I'm a hothead. And I remember John saying younger, like, I am a Spanish guy. We run yes. hot. Like, that's not fucking true. Like, you're no, a but human. It but it is. But, I mean, it's more than that. And John, I mean, I've, t- I've talked to John forever about it. And, and he's like, buddy, listen, your superpower is your focus and intensity. Mm-hmm. Okay? That dude will grind through. I mean, one thing you never really hear him say is, God, I hit it like shit. And yep. he may say, I didn't do this well. He's never going to quit. Oh, never. Just drag me through the mud. No, never. I mean, if you were fighting him in an MMA fight, you'd be exhausted leaving the ring. Yeah, you I you mean, could know I'm gonna I'm gonna kick your ass, but mm-hmm. we're gonna leave this ring tired. Yeah, that's the way he is, and and I don't know how you. Again, I don't think it's Spanish. Like that, I think that was my point. Like it's not I'm Spanish. No. I have fight. Like he just has that in him. He's a and I he's a I don't. Yeah, I don't, I don't think everyone has that, and I think that's yes, okay. You, no, 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 they do. They do. Grittiness, right, has to it, – it's different at different layers of pressure, right? But grittiness is obviously what are you fighting for? The thing about John 
is John will say, I'm not trying to always win. I'm trying to get myself in position to win. But sometimes a top five is a victory for me. See, yeah. if we're all or nothing, that's a problem. And, and I know people say, well, PGA Tour players don't want to win enough. They make so much money. Trust me, dude. Every Fuck. single dude out there is all about winning. If you want to know what that's like. If you're in the winning about. conversation, you're rich. Yeah, I mean, they're already rich. John, somebody like that, I mean, he loves to compete, okay? But the thing yeah. about, you know, all my guys, Billy Sand, all those guys, they just love to be in the, in the battle. Davis, I mean, they just get after it, right? But the brilliance of what they do is that they can redefine what winning is. There's layers of winning. Now, because I'm not, I, I can't control, like in a junior tournament, some kid in the opposite wave goes out and shoots 63. I didn't even see that dude today, right? In baseball, I can play a great game. I can beat and do everything I can, and I can lose, but I can go three for four and feel good about it to some degree. In golf, you can't do that. And that's what makes it hard, right, is that people have to manage that. There's layers of understanding. And so to me, that's when we go into the learning side is what did you learn in that position? What did you learn? I, I think it's where you and I actually probably work perfectly without even realizing it Correct. as sugar and spice because I am so – you can't control the outcome at all. Nope. Whereas you are probably – not that you think you can control the outcome, but you're like super lame way of saying, but like Tony Robbins, let's keep energy up, let's keep focusing. Whereas I am focused on the negative like Davis specifically like, you have no fucking idea what's going to happen on this shot. And you're really, really, really good at golf. And I still don't know what you're going to do with this shot. That, that it's, it's funny because looking back at Zalatoris, there, there was a thread that I wrote on this poker forum where looking back at it, this literally this week I was reading it. And, and, and as I was saying, like Will always told me, he knew exactly what shot I was going to hit. I didn't have to tell him. But when he was 14, 15 years old, I had no idea what he was about to do. So much of golf is I should know. I don't care what your preferred shot is, what your strengths and weaknesses are, but I should know kind of what you're going to do on this shot. And with Will, back when he was 15, I was like, he could have shot me like, I had, didn't expect that. And he's like, well, that's what I was trying to do. Here's why. Sam and, but and, and Davis – they're so talented, but we have so little control over the golf ball. And the quicker you accept that. But there's a simple fact trick to that. The vast majority of golfers fail to have clear intention before they ever hit a shot. That is the point of the mental scorecard. Like, literally, 100%. that's it. Yep. A again, like. There's again, like I do try to sell apps, not for any sort of a uh, financial reason, but I'm like, I'd like to make more money, dude. Just knowing what you're trying to do with the shot and why I don't even give a shit. It's the wrong reason and the wrong target, yep. but a clear picture of what you're trying to do. And it's not as simple as the, uh, uh, I was about to say Pels, whoever it is, aim small, miss small, all that stuff. Just, what were you trying to do with this shot exactly and why? And then when you hit the shot, were you committed to it? That's it. I, I think those two things. Is not there anything to... really? I mean, if we boil it down to that, is there anything else you really need to do? Like, no. If you're listening to this, it's like, what the hell did you want to do? If you can't verbalize it out loud, you can't do it. Sorry. And that's. Okay? You can do it at home by yourself because there's no pressure. It's, it's funny because when I was playing, I'm 49 in two weeks now. When I was playing professional golf in my 20s, I played in the U.S. Open. I played in corner of events or whatever. But I hated playing with a caddy. And in retrospect, it was because I hated saying, hey, I'm going to aim at this person. I'm going to draw it off of that because I knew I'm not going to do that. I knew that's what I'm going to try to do. But it's not actually what was going to happen. But, but that's why pitching and golf are so similar. So like, similar. How could I stand up and you're stepping into the plate and you're leaning over the plate a little bit and I got a first pitch fastball in the outer third and I'm like, oh, hell, I don't know if it's going to go there or not. I'm just going to throw it. Are you kidding me? Oh, my God. No, I had to know that. 
Because here's the, the deal. Well, the baseball. key is, if the key is. If, you, if, you, if you're wild in the zone, you get hammered. The key is, you know it's what you're trying to do, and you also know it's not what's going to happen. The, the, the main thing that I feel like I've really, if there's anything golf related that's, again, I don't dispute when people like, people talk about this forever. If there's any one thing that I feel like I have brought to the forefront, to the limelight is you can't aim here and hope you pull it. And I don't yeah. know if it's commensurate to pitching like, well, I want to paint that corner, but I'm really kind of hoping I throw a ball but if it goes in the strike zone, that's cool too. Like that's yeah, not no. committed. No, the, we we had different patterns that we threw. So we had we had a pattern that if we missed, we'd rather miss over the plate, and then we had another pattern that if we missed, we'd rather miss off the plate. So that just changed our 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 dispersion a little bit. But now, so, do you see? Like, do you see actually that's not correct, or is that is it well, just baseball, a semantics? No, in baseball, it's very correct because when you're facing a guy. Like, uh, let me see, who did I face? Um, well, I'll give you an example. There was a kid that played for Arkansas. His name was Kit Pello. He played in the major leagues for the A's. I missed one of those little spots, and he must have hit a ball 520 feet off me. Okay. Was that anecdotal, or was that because you missed your spot? Now, sometimes they would swing through it, and you'd get away with it. Yeah, fuck it. doesn't okay. matter. doesn't matter. You got away with it. But sometimes you got punished. And so – for us to play for LSU, you couldn't miss in those spots. You had to miss the right way because we were dealing with, I mean, our coach coached to, he coached the percentages, you know, 80% of the time, if you walk the leadoff batter of an inning, they score. Can't, we, we, we can't, we can't just run math. those odds. It's just math. Okay. So if you're going to miss, you got to miss here. If you got to do this, you got to do that, you know, it was whatever, but we were so trained in it. We were literally like when I play with a kid who goes through your program. I know what you're going to do. I can see the, the gears working. They're detailed. They're, my players at Bama football, they know how to read a defense and an offense backwards and forwards 16 ways to Sunday. You ask Bryce Young what he's going to do. Not going to sneak up. Boom, 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 boom. Yep. They can tell you. Like I had a kid in my office. Um, it was a safety the other day, and he was like, oh, I know what every position on the defense is going to do, and I know what the offense is going to do too. Now he's been in the he's been in the program a couple of years. He knows it. Mac Jones, he knew it. Like, I mean, it's just you could see, and when you when you see that level of maturity, yes, there's natural misses, but we're going to control the factors where most people screw up. And again, I think that's where you just keep whittling down from kindergarten to first grade to sixth grade to ninth grade yeah. to twelfth grade to college. Like again, there are I, I would not have realized this as much until I had kids and I'm, I'm like watching my nine year old. I'm like, holy shit, that kid is so much more athletic than you. It's mind boggling. And that kid, if they are given the right instruction, like my kid's never going to catch up. Like it, they're, like they're not well, going to catch up. I, I had I had a coach tell me the other day said their son their son is going out for basketball and he looked across and he said, there was a kid at the same age that was about six inches taller and handled the ball. Like, like, like LeBron James, like his court vision was just insane of how he moved the ball. And he's like, son, you better get really good at church basketball. Cause that's your future. Like, <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. That's like, okay. That's okay. Like, you know, you, you, but it's the same way we used to call it how to win awareness. Golfers have how to win awareness. There's, you know, that's what you see on the PGA tours is, is I think a lot of times, people look at this and they they don't realize that a guy's going to chip you know like i'll never forget something that billy shared with me a long time ago you're talking to a rookie and he goes always chip into the wind he's like but that's what's funny is literally the math backs that up now yeah so oh, yeah. like decade what i teach there are certain things where you want to be under this one-to-one -one ratio so four yards off the green to a pin that's five yards on that's just a chip shot but you can actually go to six or seven yards off it's, if it's into the wind. Like, it's, it's, a, it's a huge advantage. And what's weird is it, it changes from, like, eight feet proximity to nine feet proximity. But what they don't realize is that the, what it compresses that inner circle around the hole. And so there are just so many more gimmies 
that it's not even close to like debatable. And it, again, it's just so weird how there's so, so smaller margins that don't seem like that big of a deal. It could be even five or six feet, mm-hmm. but the implications are unreal what it actually does for your overall up and down rates. So some of our, some of our players on this that we all work with, they're going to bet the center of the uh, craps table, aren't they? Yes. And they're going to come back and say they're great at it, aren't they? Yo, 11. (laughs) Well, again, I hit it. Well, again, back to my speech at Wharton today. Yeah, if you want to throw 10 bucks down on it and not count on it, great, go for it. But but this is the these things are amazing when you actually look at the math. Wait, who did, who who won that night when we played craps? Uh, well, Jason Enlow, SMU's coach, did for sure. I don't know. Yeah, I definitely remember one of us did. But I think it was me, wasn't it? Yeah, probably. <laughs> Again, I, I tend to run into uh, cocktails and uh, other uh, issues. Yeah, I don't know. But it, it, it again, it is just amazing how. Why don't we do this? Why don't we do this workshop around the golf co- conventions again? Oh fuck, I'm in, for okay. sure. And it, not just golf coaches; anybody can come. We'll do it. See if I can see if we know somebody who's affiliated with a golf course up in Vegas during December time frame and do something. Thousand percent. I'd love that all for right. sure. Well, let me let you go. You've been out talking to smart people all day, uh. and. and uh, this is I'm been tired. Good. I know. Listen, I, I, hope, I hope some of this was coherent. It was very good. Listen, for everybody following, make sure you check them out at decadegolf.com. Decade Golf is really, I love it. It's how we used to pitch, guys. I mean, you know, for baseball players, it's the reason I've always gravitated towards it and uh, always want my players to go through it because it gives us a strategy which helps intention, which helps acceptance, and it allows you to play the odds in your favor, which is what it's all about. But, Scott, you do great work. That's a good sales players. pitch. I know. I know. I don't know, maybe I need to be an ambassador for Decade Golf. Maybe uh, I knew what it was. Well, fair enough. <laughs> All right. Thanks, bud. All right. You guys appreciate you as always. <laughs>